Welcome back to another episode of Guitar Talk with Todd. Here is the audio edition of a portion of my interview with the great Peter Frampton. This was originally published in print and online in 2019. I am releasing this audio in celebration of Peter's birthday this past Friday. So happy birthday to Peter. Please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel and enjoy my interview with the great Peter Frampton. So how old were you when you first started playing guitar, Peter? Um, eight. <laughs> okay. Do you remember your first guitar at all? Oh, yeah. It was a, um, my father, um, I, I had been playing a, a banjo lele, which is a banjo-shaped uke that my, my dad had given me from my grandmother, and, um, uh, and so that just had the four strings, and my hands were very small at that point when I was seven or eight. So it was perfect. But then I needed that extra two strings. Uh, I wanted a guitar. So for that Christmas, probably 1958, oh, my God, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, he went and got himself a gut string uh, classical uh, acoustic, and he got me a, a steel string um just regular, run-of-the-mill, no-name acoustic. <laughs> so do you remember what the first song you actually learned on the guitar was? Well, probably um, I'd already learned um, on the on the banjolele, he taught me, my dad had taught me, Hang Down Your Head, Tom Dooley. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and Michael Row the Boat, I think. Those were the two. So those were probably the first two that I tried on the guitar. So were guys like Scotty Moore and Link Ray and those guys a big influence on you in your early years when you first started playing? Yes. I mean, I didn't know who Scotty Moore was at the time. I ended up meeting and being a friend of his, which I still can't believe, before we lost him. But um, uh, I just... I wasn't a big Elvis fan, but I was a big Scotty Moore fan, not knowing who he was. I just loved the guitar playing on Elvis's records, like yeah. we all did, you know? And because it was kind of rockabilly, but it was a mixture of, of rock and jazz, you know, put together. So I loved it. So, uh, yeah, that was, he was the first person, American guitar player that I listened to that I really loved. Okay, so moving ahead, talking about, say, the late 60s guitar scene, you were on that scene, too, but were guys like Peter Green and Mick Taylor, you know, they were working with John Mayall's Blues Breakers and stuff at the time, and then, of course, Peter went on to form Fleetwood Mac. Uh, were those guys an influence on you at all, and did, did you ever get to catch them live? Yes, oh, yeah, I saw Peter Green play with uh, Blues Breakers, um, I saw them all play with Blues Breakers, Eric, um, Peter Green, and Mick Taylor, I think. Wow. Uh, yeah, at the Flamingo or one of those Wardour, Wardour Street clubs. That was the the beginnings of, uh, you know, with Clapton. I saw Clapton, too, with, with Blues Breakers. And, uh, in fact, I just told him that when we did Crossroads. Wow. <laughs> so, um, uh, those... Those ones you mentioned, Mick Taylor, or I mentioned, uh, Peter Green, Eric Clapton, all of those um, were, I was, I loved all their playing, you know, at that point. And um, so did everybody else. That was when you'd go, you'd drive around London and on the overpasses, you'd see the, the train bridges, you'd see uh, graffiti and it said, Clapton is God, you know. Right. So... <laughs> wow. So now what, I, I know you've always said Django Reinhardt was, and you were influenced by him, and I believe I read you actually took classical lessons too in the early years, right? Or... Yes, yes. Okay, now, so how did the, I mean, Django Reinhardt is kind of, 
I, I love his stuff, but I mean that that kind of came out of left field. Like, how did you sort of get into Django originally? Well, um, by default, um, my parents um, danced to the Hot Club de France, which is Django Reinhardt, Stefan Grappelli, and the other guys in the band, and um, that was their music that they go up to London and dance to before, during, and and uh, uh, probably right after the war. Um, and um, so when when we got our first record player, um, uh, I think I got for Christmas, I got uh, The Shadows' first album, and my dad bought himself and mom um, the best of uh, Hot Club de France. So I would put my, it was in the living room, so we were all there in the living room, you know, and I would play my Shadows album and play along with it with the guitar. And then I'd, uh, I'd go upstairs to uh, leave the room and go upstairs to uh, practice in my bedroom. And they would put Django Reinhardt on. And I couldn't get out of the room quick enough. You know, it was like, <laughs> what is this? You know, so first of all, it's not electric. And secondly, I don't understand what's going on. Right. So it sounds like, as my kids used to, because I did it to my kids too. My kids said, oh God, dad's listening to that silent movie music again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. So anyway, um, each, this would happen over and over and over again. And I, in the end, I didn't leave the room. I stayed in the room while he played Django Reinhardt. Right. And I suddenly started to smile and go, holy crap, this guy's good. Yeah. You know, and, and from a very early age, I realized I'll never be able to do this, but I'm going to give it a good try. <laughs> right, right. Wow. And so, so it was my, uh, the person that was my mentor to start, to start me off was Hank Marvin from the shadows. Um, but at the same time, um, I was listening to the extreme, um, talent, uh, uh, and, um, dexterity uh, of Django Reinhardt flying up and down the fingerboard with only two fingers working, you know? So, um, I, I was, I was caught by the jazz bug at the same time as I was caught by the rock bug. So, and blues, rock, rock, blues, and jazz. It all sort of happened at the same time for me. So they were always, I wasn't one or the other until, you know, I, um, during the herd, I was listening to a lot more jazz because everyone was starting to sound like Eric Clapton. And I, I thought, well, there's already a couple of those guys that are really good. Peter Green, you know, yeah. uh, Eric Clapton. And, um, and so I thought, well, um, I think I'll go the other way. So that's when I, I changed my listening to everything to specifically just listening to jazz for a while. And that was during the herd period. So that when I got to Humble Pie, that was the formula. That was when I formulated what I, I call my style because um, I had obviously been listening to rock. I'd obviously been listening to blues. I'd obviously been listening to jazz. And Humble Pie was um, an area where I could combine all three and it would work because Steve Marriott's guitar style was very much hard blues, a hard edge blues style. And mine was heavy rock, but also a more lyrical solo style. And because of the jazz influence. And um, so that's when I brought that, brought it all together. And um, uh, one day I woke up and during the formulation of the first, year of humble pie and said i think i sound like me now you know and it's a wonderful feeling when you think well yeah this is so now um i'm still listening to from then on still listening to all these players um but realizing that you know i can i can pull pull licks from other people but i'll never play it quite like they do and what do you do you play it like you 
and then you change it a little bit and then it more you morph into it morphs into another part of your library of of licks that you keep up there you know i know earlier you and i were talking about bb king and how we both had a connection to him and we were laughing about how he tells you to call him B. I know the first time I met him and as I got to know him better and better, he would just keep reminding me not to call him Mr. King. He wanted to be called B. So let's talk about BB a little bit. So the first time I, uh, I the first time uh, I met BB, I'd never met him before, see? And uh, so I, I got on his bus and they told me he's in the back. So I go to the back of the bus and I'm nervous as, anything you know and i said um mr king i said call me b call me b you know and i said okay b um and, and i said uh would it be okay if um if we uh and he said peter sit down <laughs> <laughs> sit down i said okay and he just he sort of looked at me smiled and he said this is your show you tell me what you want me to do and i'll do it for you and i was just on the floor like oh my god this yeah. is the this is my kind of guy he's so humble um for being such an innovator and i just we became instant friends you know it was unbelievable well i know when you did the framptons guitar circus shows you would go out every night and play with bb on the thrill is gone Yes, um, when we announced that we were going to do the, the guitar circus and we put out some invites, BB was the first one that answered, literally, um, and said, count me in. And I couldn't believe it. I was just blown away. And uh, then, then he said, well, you know, you got to come and play with me every night. I said, what? He said, yeah, I want you to come out. So I was... <laughs> Uh, wherever I was backstage, if I wasn't watching, I'd hear, uh, the king wants you. <laughs> <laughs> so out I'd go. And, and of course, he was sitting down at that point. So I sat with him on a chair and got all these wonderful pictures of me and him playing together. So it was, that was, uh, that was something very, very special. That's great. Okay. So you were reunited with your black last Paul a few years back. Um, I know you had been missing that for 30 years. That's such a great story, how you were reunited with that. Is that the guitar you've been primarily playing? I, I, I mean, I could see why you would. <laughs> you have to have missed it being gone for 30 years. <laughs> well, it's funny because when I got it back, um, a lot of the numbers we were doing, um, apart from the live, live album, were not you. That guitar was not used because it wasn't around. So... Uh, the, the, um, I call it the Phoenix now because it rose from the ashes. The Phoenix, uh, was used for, you know, do you feel, um, and, and things like that. Very few numbers when it first came back. And now, um, it's, <laughs> I'm playing it on nearly everything. It just takes over. It can't help itself. Um, it's just, it's like, um, an old pair of shoes. Um, you know, they say never wear a new pair of shoes on stage. Uh, and it's so true, you know, uh, it just won't feel right. And, uh, so it's like an old pair of shoes. I just put it back, put them back, put that guitar back on and gradually it just took over. And it, it, uh, I, I think I, the only other guitar that I'm using, um, apart from that is, um, a 335, a 64 335, Freddie King year. And, uh, <laughs> oh, wow, there you go. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is, the Freddie King year, same color, everything. And um, so uh, I use that, and I have um, uh, a new Les Paul that I play for anything in E-flat. We do a couple of numbers in E-flat, like uh, Black Old Sun and uh, the Humble Pie stuff we do is, in, is a, a half step down. Okay. You chose to close your shows, including the final one that you did on October 12th with the Beatles, While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Uh, I think that's an incredible choice. What does that song mean to you? I mean, obviously we all love the song, but does it have an extra special meaning to you? Was there a particular reason you chose that song to close with? Um, well, 
I originally chose it because uh, I, obviously of my friendship with George Harrison. And when we lost him, um, uh, it was, I think, in November of that the year that we lost him. And then in January, I was living in Cincinnati at the time. I was doing a, um, uh, a charity, uh, put on a charity show with all local talent plus myself as the headliner and, um, and decided um, that I wanted to pay tribute to George. And so I called the band like the day before the show and said, look, I'd like to try my guitar gently weeps at the sound check. Um, see if we could, you know, because it would be great to do that um, as the last number as a tribute to George uh, for the charity show. So anyway, we did it that night. The place went berserk. And I got this, there was a very special feeling in the room when we did that number. And we've done it, not every show, but a lot of shows since then we've closed with it because it's kind of, um, it, it's something that you can't really put into words. There's a feeling that everyone gets in the room, uh, including obviously us from the stage that everyone just, if, if you're going to say goodbye at that point with that last number, it's a hell of a way. It's such a powerful song and, um, it just draws everybody in and it, it's, um, it's just been one of my favorite live numbers to do, and I think it it just says goodbye in a nice way. Yeah, I know on the blues album you recorded live in the studio with the whole band as it was happening. Um, I'm such a huge fan of that way of recording. I know everyone shares files and emails the tracks to each other now. I don't really understand that way of recording. I know it's convenient, but I think you lose so much of that human touch. Well, they become, the tracks become, um, they lose feeling. Right. They, 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 there's no, there's no camaraderie between you and anybody else because if you're playing on top of a bass and a, a bass and drums and a piano, they've already played their part separately too. Right, right. <laughs> and then you come in and there's no conversation. Music is a con with a band. A music is a conversation, right? And it's a conversation between everybody in the band. It's not one person. It's not just the guy who's playing the lead at that particular time. We all get behind and listen to everyone who's playing, and that changes the way you play to accommodate what they're playing. And then you play something that you didn't think you were going to play because of what they played, and you bounce it's 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 as i say a living breathing thing is a live band you know and and it's you it might be a number you played a song you played many many hundreds of times but every time you play it it's slightly different and that's what we do we try and make things a little different every night um because uh, otherwise it would be would be you know boring 